Democrats. Panera now we join Radio 4 and Election Call. Good morning and welcome to Election Call, the programme that puts you as viewers, listeners and voters in direct contact with the politicians who are competing for your support in order that they might win the next general election, this general election. This morning it is your election call to Robin Cook, the man at the centre of the long controversy over the future of the National Health Service. However, do feel free to ask him about any other aspect of Labour policy, from public spending, taxation, Scotland, or indeed proportional representation, of which he is one of his party's leading advocates. The lines are still open. The number to ring, 71 5000 And now it is your election call. Roseanne Williams from Wolverhampton to Robin Cook. Mr Cook, you have promised to spend a billion pounds mm. extra mm. on the NHS. That's right. Um, could you tell me what areas you're planning to use this money? We will tomorrow be unveiling the full health budget and how we are spending that money. But there are two critical tasks that we face. First of all, we must use that money in order to improve patient care. And we must tackle, for instance, the, the quite scandalous way in which over the last five years there's been a reduction in the number of nurses in the wards. 7,000 fewer nurses working in our wards than five years ago. That's one of the priorities that we're going to tackle. The second thing we must do uh, is that we must also tackle the lack of investment in so many areas of the health service. For instance, the fact that we've got too many old ambulances running, which is one of the reasons why the ambulance service in many areas is now becoming less reliable. What's important about that is it doesn't just help the health service, it doesn't just provide a better emergency service, but of course it is also a contribution to Britain's economic recovery because those ambulances are all made in Britain, they'll create work, they'll back people back into jobs, they'll stimulate the economy, they'll increase tax revenue and they'll enable us to do better in the health service the year after. Roseanne Williams. Now, uh, isn't it true, though, that you promised a national minimum wage and that in the health service hmm. this is going to cost half a billion pounds? You're also promised to abolish compulsory competitive tendering and charges for dental checks and eye tests. Mm -hmm. And altogether, this is going to add up to another about a billion pounds. So where's your extra billion pounds going to come from? Well, you've made four separate points. Let's take those uh, one by one. First of all, on the question of the minimum wage, I believe that if you are serious about achieving a healthy nation, then one of the things you've got to face, which this government keeps running away from, is that there is a clear link between poverty and ill health. We now have more children being brought up in families in poverty than ever before. We really do need to realise that if we're serious about reducing inequalities in health, we've got to reduce inequalities in income. And I make no apology for the fact that Labour is, yes, committed to bringing Britain into the 20th century of Europe, joining the other countries of Europe that have a minimum wage. Is on Rosanne, the question, on, just on the minimum wage thing, let's stick with that for a second. Yes. Is Rosanne Williams right to say that it'll cost half a billion pounds approximately in the NHS? The figures are changing, but yes, broadly, that is the figure I gave last and time. And has that got to come out that of That was the point I was just coming on to. Out of this no, billion. It, it will not come out of that billion. Uh, we have a clear commitment on which we are all agreed that we will be fully funding pay awards to which we agree within the NHS. We will not be taking the money for pay awards in the NHS out of patients care. Therefore, that money is not any part of the billion pounds that we're discussing for investment in real improvement in patient care. Can you bring together the other things she says and deal with the costs in general? Uh, I think one can't bring them together because they are separate issues, Jonathan, if you'll allow me, and I think she is entitled to an answer on those points. Two points, and I'll be brief on them. First of all, on the question of competitive tendering, I'm always fascinated when the Conservatives claim that there are savings cuts as a result of the introduction of competitive tendering, because on the other side, they do keep claiming it hasn't reduced standards and specifications of cleansing and catering in our hospitals. Frankly, anybody who goes round some of the major hospitals can see that they are in a worse state of cleanliness. Nursing Standards has been running a magnificent campaign highlighting the growing filth in some hospitals and the increase in infection to patients' result. Now, yes, we are determined to increase standards of cleanliness in our hospitals, and yes, we are recognising that that may require additional money, not because we're abolishing competitive tendering, but because we're going to increase standards of service. And the third point? On the third point on the eye tests, we are determined to bring back the free eye tests, and I'll tell you why. In the two years since this government introduced charges for eye tests, there have been four million fewer eye tests than in the two years beforehand. Now, Jonathan, if only a fraction 
of those four million people who have not had their eyes tested now because they can't afford to go, if only a fraction of them go on to develop serious disorders of the eye, it's going to cost the National Health Service far more than it would to give them a free eye test. That's why we're going to bring it back and we're going to regard it as a very sound, prudent investment. You mentioned wages. Just one thing on that. H how much of the one billion, which is 500 billion mm. per year, um, how much of that is actually going to go into wages one way or another? It's not going to wait. Not at all. No, it's going to go into service provision. Though I will say that one of the thing, commitments we did make, as I, as I indicated, is we'll fully fund peer awards. This will enable us to make sure that the peer awards the government's already approved are fully funded. They're actually shortchanging the NHS. Roseanne Williams, does that, that answer your question? That you're actually planning to put £2 billion into the health service then, doesn't it? Because you're spending £500 million on this wage claim. You've also promised to reduce prescription charges by a pound which is another 135 million. Where I, I, is so all this money coming from? Roseanne Williams, is your... I, 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 I wish I had... Can I just go back to Roseanne Williams? Is your... The, the test you're putting to Mr Cook that, that he's going to put more well, money into the health service and that's a good thing, or he's putting more money into the health service and he's not going to be able to find the money? Well, he's putting more money into the health service, but not a penny of it is going to go on patient care. No, not that's at all. The thing that no, 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 the entire billion is going on patient care, Roseanne. That's what I've been saying to you. OK, Roseanne Williams, thank you for your call. And now let us move on to Jill Tuck from Wisbech in Cambridgeshire. Will Labour still abolish the trust hospitals mm. that are working well for patients? And if so, what will this cost? Oh, there will be very substantial savings, Miss, uh, Mrs Williams. There will be very substantial savings. No, Jill Tuck. Uh, Jill Tuck. I'm terribly sorry. I'm terribly. Uh, there will be very substantial savings, Miss Tuck. Uh, first of all, if you look at what's happened as a result of the government's changes, there has been a whole new army of bureaucrats introduced to make this immense paper chase run. We now have over 20,000 additional managers and clerks working in the NHS compared with five years ago. At the same time, nurses are going down. Now, I want to get the jobs in the wards, not in the offices. Secondly, to return to the, the first thrust of your question, yes, we are going to bring the trusts back into an integrated health service. And the reason for that is quite fundamental, and it does touch on the different philosophy between ourselves and the Conservatives and our approach to the health service. What the Conservatives are trying to do is create a market in the health service in which hospitals compete against each other for business and health authorities shop around for the cheapest bargain. Now, I don't find that an attractive model for the health service. I don't actually think it's an efficient model for the health service. What I want is to have the hospitals back operating together for patient care within an integrated health authority that represents local people and is accountable to local people. I would also add one last point here. If you look at the way medical technology is developing, we have enormous opportunities now to get services into the community, into the GP surgery, into the community health clinic, rather than provided in the hospital. This is the very time when we should be breaking down the boundaries and the barriers between hospitals and other services, not setting them up on their own, going into Jill the Tuck. Jill Tuck? Um, it's, it's amazing, actually, I find, that the surveys that were done on the Trust, only a few months after they had started, which you would think throw teething problems, but they've shown significant improvement in care. Isn't it a waste just to discard trust? Because I feel it's because you think it's a conservative idea. Shouldn't political point scoring be kept out of patient what care? Improvements oh. do you what, what improvements do you have in, uh, have in mind? The fact that the actual local people are running the NHS, the local need, which is the whole idea of trust, as in GP fund holding. We have a GP fund holder in our Let, let's area, let's, let's, which uh, improved... OK, I just want to stick with the, with, with the hospital so, we, so that the people who may not be as closely associated with it as you are can understand the general point. Robin Cook? Well, there are a variety of points there, but let's first of all take this rather odd claim that it enables local people to run their service. Uh, we have been through, the people have been appointed to run these trusts. Now, let us remember, when these hospitals opt out, they become owned and run by a board of directors. That board of directors can hire or fire anybody in the hospital. Indeed, in some cases, they are firing people in the hospital. They decide what specialities they're going to offer in the market for contract. They decide how many private patients they're going to have in the hospital. Now, these are the local people that are running the service. And we've been down those local people and we've looked at who they are. And overwhelmingly, those local people are not people who remotely represent the local community. They are overwhelmingly local businessmen. And fascinatingly, the biggest single business interest among them is property development. Now, I actually don't think the NHS is safe in the hands of the state agents. Jill Tuck? Well, that is, it's not a clinical thing, is it? The it was the point the you made, The actual Jill. care, the actual care comes from the clinical expertise. 
but you have got to ah. run it efficiently so that the money that you're saying you're going to put in, if it's not mm -hmm. run efficiently, it will be wasted. Hmm. Now, to me, a nurse is absolutely superb yes. as a carer, yes. but she couldn't run a business, which is the way it's got to be to be efficient, so that the clinicians can do their job as efficiently as they always have done. Well, first of all, of course, you're absolutely right. The care in the ward is provided by the doctors and the nurses and the other staff, some of whom patients may not actually meet, but are very important to the functioning of the hospital, like the people, for instance, who work in the laboratories. And in no case, not one single case, where these hospitals were created as trusts and opted out of the local NHS, not one single case were all these people allowed to express their view in a proper ballot. And in all the ballots that were held unofficially, they all came down against it. So the people who actually do what you're defining as the real work were very firmly against it. But I would say, Jill, what I think you've done there very helpfully is touch up the major difference in philosophy between ourselves and I think the Conservative Party if I can use that term they want to see hospitals run as businesses and if you run hospitals as businesses then what you end up with is commercial priorities we want to see hospitals to run as public services in which those clinical priorities come first. Are you saying that the trust hospitals um, and with the surveys to which Jill Tuck referred and their throughputs are operating not in the interests of patients? Is that your charge? Without slightest doubt, over a period of time, what will happen if you have a market in healthcare is that people have to respond to that market. But no healthcare. evidence of that yet. You're not oh. saying that's happened well, yet. Let me, let me give you a particular example from one manager who is hoping to set up a trust in this coming month. Month. He was challenged as to why it was that the hospital was cutting beds. Was that not going to make the trust less viable? And he said, no, no. If I have fewer beds, I can be more certain that those beds will always be full. It may, he said, be unfortunate for local people, but it makes commercial sense. Now, I'm against that kind of commercial sense, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Jill Tuck. And Jim Storer now from Birmingham. Uh, good morning, Mr. Cook. Good morning. Um, Mr. Cook. Uh, all healthcare systems throughout the Western world have a problem with the rationing of healthcare. And I wondered, apart from our, our traditional way of doing it, which is by waiting list, whether you have any new ideas um, uh, to cover that, that rationing of healthcare. And secondly, um, how does this square with choice, which if nothing else is expensive, uh, and empowering of the patient and enfranchising of the patient, which I would assume is something you would agree with, and certainly I would. Well, I, I think, if, if I may say so, you first of all led me up a false premise and then produced uh, the wrong conclusion. Since I'm not proposing rationing of care, I don't think you can then spring on me how I square that with greater choice. There's not the slightest doubt that under the scheme that we are proposing, there would be greater choice for patients. At the moment, under the scheme that the government have introduced since last April, patients have lost their freedom to choose which hospital they want to go to. They are now limited to those hospitals where the managers have placed contracts or where they're willing to pay for the patients to go. Now, as a result of that, there is less choice for the patient. The patient cannot decide which hospital he or she wants to be treated in. And it is also, to come back to your point about rising costs and the need for efficiency, it is also less efficient because it does mean that patient and their GP cannot pick on the hospital where the waiting list may be shortest and which can treat them most quickly. I had one quite clear case of a patient who was waiting for two years who had got agreement with a hospital in the London area that they could treat her within a week and only the day before the operation, her health authority announced they would not pay for it. Now, Dr. Storer, that loses her choice, but it's also less efficient. Right. Dr. Storer? Could I take you back to the rationing, uh, which was the main thrust of my uh, uh, question? Well, you did also ask about choice. No, hang on, let him put okay. the question on rationing. Uh, that, 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 in fact, it doesn't matter where you look in the world today, all governments, all providers of healthcare systems have a problem with rationing. Uh, which produces waiting lists, Dr. Which Storer, produces waiting lists in this country mm. uh, and, and, and elsewhere. Does, does Mr. Cook, do, do you have any new ideas as to how we should address this problem, uh, yeah. looking into the future yes. particularly, uh, when I, I can only see it getting worse? Well, if you want to ask me about our ideas on the waiting list, let me respond to that. Yes, we have a new idea on the waiting list, and we have made a clear commitment in the health policy that we've produced. What we want to do is to increase the proportion of people who are treated in the early months to increase the percentage of patients who will get in in the first three months. Now, if we do it that way, what it means is it is not 
I, the politician, who is deciding on the rationing of who gets in first or who goes to the bottom of the list, it is the doctors who see those patients and who are medically qualified to decide on their clinical priority who will do that. And that, I think, is the right way into deciding who gets in first and who may be able to wait. The way this government's approaching it is that they have directed doctors, irrespective of their clinical judgment, irrespective of what they think of the need and urgency of the case, they will give priority to those who have been waiting two years. And as a result of that, you have the ludicrous position that I heard of during this past week in which one GP told me he had just been rung up by the health authority and told that there was a patient on the waiting list of that GP who needed a tattoo removed, who'd been waiting two years. They had to do it by 1st April to meet the target. They were therefore going to pay a very large sum of money to send him expensively to a private hospital. Now, if you're talking about sensible priorities and who gets in first, that seems to me an absolutely daft priority well, and I want to change that. Dr. Sora? I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. If you, if, I mean, good, just good. to You've again to push, you, push you with, with rationing, I mean, mm. within the West Midlands, it is impossible within the National Health Service to have your tattoo removed. Now, this is the... Uh, uh, and it has been all my time in, in medicine. Uh, now, this is rationing, if you like. I mean, it's very difficult within the West Midlands to have your infertility mm. investigated and treated. Uh, rationing again. And you're saying, Dr. Sora, mm. just to get the general point mm. clear, you're saying that this is inevitable <coughs> when demand exceeds supply. Absolutely. Now, and I wondered what Mr. Well, Cook's it, idea is of addressing this problem. Yeah, well, he, he, has, he has addressed them. Just let me ask... Can, can, can I just say to Dr. Sora that there have been more tattoos removed in the last two months than the entire history of the National Health Service, and it's entirely political to meet that two-year deadline. Not within the West Midlands. Can I ask um, you, uh, Robin Cook, you are not saying that if a Labour government comes to power, despite what you are um, uh, promising to do, that waiting lists are going to come dramatically down, are you? What we are saying is that we will start tackling waiting lists in the first year and continue to make progress thereafter. Okay, but let's... Jonathan, you, you've had me in the studio for a full hour putting questions about, about our plans on funding on the waiting list, and we have always been quite clear. We are inheriting a very serious situation. We've never pretended it can be put right overnight. Um, and now to Tom Waring from Redditch in Worcestershire. Mr Waring, it's your election call to Robin Cook. Leaving aside your nutty book, Economics and Principles of Management, Mr Cook, is it not inexcusable to play on the fears of people like me <coughs> who are terrified of things medical by giving publicity to human error in the NHS? What do you have in have mind? Have you considered no. the effects that these uh, allegations <coughs> have on the morale of staff in the NHS? And may mm. I remind you of what happened when similar tactics were used in the teaching profession on the morale of teachers. Now, just, Mr Waring, what allegations uh, do you refer to that Robin Cook is alleged to have made? Well, there's quite a number of them that are daily published in the mm. press, but in Redditch here, we had allegations that beds were going to be closed, mm. which mm. were proved completely yeah. unfounded. Yeah. Uh, another instance that readily springs to mind is that at a hospital in Birmingham, where they regurgitated a complaint that was no less than four years old. And in this particular instance, he which, concerned which right? a patient that was probably mentally disturbed. Let's deal with the, right. general, the general case that you have been um, talking no, up no, John, individual John, misery. Respect, with respect, one cannot deal with the gen general case. You can't? Without, you, one cannot, if, you, if I can finish my sentence, John, you cannot deal with the general case whilst letting pass unchallenged specific allegations of that character. I am wholly unfamiliar with this case that your caller is suggesting that we have used, and most certainly we would not use in any way any patient who is not able to give their free consent to our raising their case and challenging the government on their experience. And that would certainly apply in the type of patient to which your caller is referring. Overwhelmingly, the cases that I have raised in Parliament and I have raised in the public and in the press are cases of people who have written to me detailing what has happened to them and are writing to me because they are concerned at what their experience tells them about the present state of the health service. And they are writing to me because they want these points raised and they want their experience exposed. Every day now we are getting about 100 to 200 letters from patients who want to tell me about their experience. Now that is an immense strength to us in dealing with the government which trades in statistics rather than the real experience of those people writing to them. Mr Waring? I think that Mr Cook's reply is as credible as his claims not long ago that the Conservative Party was going to privatise 
the uh, well, national why, why do you claim. Say, Mr. Waring, why do you say, claim and is a claim I stand by. Mr. Waring, he, 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 he gave an answer saying that he used particular cases. Why do you say that it's not credible? Uh, I firmly believe that it is totally wrong to play on people's fears. It would be far more professional if it was done where the complaints, first of all, were investigated by the district health authority or by the professional institutions rather than blazing publicity when in a number of instances when they've been investigated the complaints that have been made no, have no, been no, proved no, to have uh, no, no I'm, validation I'm sorry. whatsoever. I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm, terribly sorry. No, I'm sorry, Jonathan. Jonathan, if I may come back. Yeah, of course you can. If I, you thank you. That's very kind. I much appreciate that. That's very good of you. Uh, not a single case that I have used has ever been disproved. I have to make that point quite clear. Uh, I mean, the reason why they're not disproved, and it's a very simple and obvious reason, is that the people who raise these cases with me know themselves far better what happened to them than with respect you do at the end of the telephone line or the minister does sitting in Whitehall. They are giving me their experience and what happened to them and they are the most credible witness of what happened to them. That is why not a single one of the cases I have raised in Parliament or in the public has ever been disproved. Thank you very much and now we will go to Mr Robert Ingle who is ringing from Leicester. Your election call to Robin Cook. Thank you. If the Labour Party is in a position to form a government after April the 9th and a Scottish Parliament is set up, mm. uh, will that be followed by another general election to resolve the anomalies that will arise at Westminster? Describe the anomalies in your mind. Well, uh, very simply this. There are 72 uh, members of Parliament representing Scotland. Mm. 48, I think, of them were Labour in the last uh, Parliament. Uh, if the Labour Party's majority depends upon the Scottish members of Parliament, as it may well do. And the Scottish Parliament is set up, those members are in a very difficult position. I'd like to know Mr Cook's uh, answer to that. Well, let's first of all start with the question of what happens in respect of Scotland, which is really the thrust of your question. Uh, we have been through the last five years in which Conservative policies have been applied in Scotland on the basis of not 72 MPs, but only 10 MPs, the 10 Conservative MPs who were elected in 1987. Since then, of course, they've lost one of their seats in a by-election in Scotland. They're now down to nine, the third party in Scotland, not even the second party in Scotland. And on the basis of those nine or ten MPs, they have posed on Scotland deeply controversial Conservative policies, such as the poll tax, which we got a year earlier than in England, and such as the opting out of hospitals, which is now going ahead in Scotland against the teeth of local resistance. Now, what the Scots are saying, perfectly reasonably, is that this is daft. It is also undemocratic and it is also inefficient because it does mean that the Scottish office is not in touch with local opinion and is not best able to work together with local community. That is why the Labour Party is, as you say quite rightly, committed to creating a Scottish Parliament which can decide if those issues affecting Scotland, such as health and education and local government, and the Scots inside themselves. Now, we then move on to what happens in relation to England. What we are saying in the case of England is that the benefits of devolution should not be kept to Scotland, that there should also be a movement towards decentralisation and devolution within England. That is why we are looking at regional assemblies directly elected around England, which would then evolve towards regional government in England. Let me bring and if back I may, in well, can I just, just, just finish this point? Okay. Can I just finish this point? If you were to look at the present British system, it is far more centralised than just about any other European system, particularly much more centralised than the German system. And I believe we're going to have a revitalised healthy society and a revitalised renewed economy. One of the things we need to do is to tackle the centralisation of power. Robert Ingle, well, is, is that an answer to, yeah. to your question? May I get in again? Mm -hmm. um, he talks about the uh, Conservative members of Parliament representing Scotland. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it's quite constitutional because we are a United Kingdom as it would be quite constitutional at the moment if a Labour government's majority depended on Scottish members of Parliament, as it has in the past. But it would be very seriously questionable constitutionally, I believe, if a Labour government's majority depended upon Scottish members of Parliament whose primary function after their Parliament had been set up was to maintain a Labour government in England. I question that Labour government's legitimacy in that case and I would suggest that the best way to deal with that situation, should it arrive, 
would be to redraw the electoral map of Scotland, giving it far less, fewer representatives than now, as it would deserve, and call another general election. OK, Robin Cook. Well, if you are saying that the Scottish members of Parliament uh, should continue to come down to Westminster, and, of course, in those circumstances, we'll be voting on the very important issues that remain part of the United Kingdom, such as, for instance, the major economic issues, the major industrial issues, questions of trade, questions of taxation, issues which we believe can only be settled at a UK level. That's yes. why we differ from With the Scottish nationalists. If, 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 if I can finish my point, that's we why we differ. Well, hold on, hold on. And let Robin, let Robin and Cook You can't the raise the Scottish constitutional question without going through how this impacts on Scotland. And if I may say so, there's a very clear difference between the Labour position and the SNP on this, in that we do believe Scotland's position would be much worse if it did not have representation where the crucial economic decisions are taken that affect Scotland, and that will be in London. Let now, me if you, if you, my no, I'm just coming, I'm just coming to that point. England. If you, if you accept that those MPs should continue to come to Westminster and should participate in those very critical issues. I honestly don't see how you can then argue that because there's a parliament in Scotland dealing with Scottish health, there should be fewer Scots taking part in the debates on the economy and taxation and trade well, in Scotland London. Well, Scotland will be overrepresented and Scotland will then be governing England or deciding probably what well, the government but, of England but, will be. Once it is your judgment, not mine. Well, the it next may Labour, it, well, no, your, It's your judgment, not mine. The mathematics the next, may make I'm that, terribly so. sorry. If I could finish my sentence, I might be able to answer your point. It's your judgment, not mine, that the next Labour government is going to depend on this majority from Scotland. I have to say, having spent the last week going round our target seats in England, I'm very confident we're going to get majority in England. Well, Robert, we've... Robin Cook, hold, hold, if, you, if you'd be kind enough, because you've made yeah. that particular point very clearly. Um, uh, Robin Cook, you yourself have said that after a, an election following the creation of um, um, a, a Scottish Parliament, you would feel it improper for you to serve um, in matters of health relating to England. Does it follow from that that you believe that Scottish MPs should not legislate, Labour MPs, under those circumstances for health, education, those matters which have devolution in Scotland? insofar as those issues relate to England? Not at all, because, John, first of all, those issues, as they are settled for in Westminster, will have a very substantial effect in Scotland, uh, whether or not they are being done through separate ministries. What happens to the Department of Health now has a very substantial bearing on what happens in the Scottish office and the Scottish but Health Service. The MPs wouldn't be able and to vote for Scottish well, health yes, matters, if, so if, why if, should... If I, the question is, because you've raised it yourself, no, haven't you? I did, I have reason. I did want to correct what you said there, because I did not say that I would be uh, departing after an election to a Scottish Parliament. What I have said is that we are standing in this election for a unity parliament. I've led Labour's campaign on health across Britain. I fully expect to see that after this election uh, I will be in the Department of Health, if appointed Department of Health. I accept that is an appointment for a full parliament and I have a programme for a full parliament yeah, but I want to see it through for a full parliament. But, but you believe, and you raised it yourself, and it's important to get it clear, that it would be wrong for you, um, maybe in that full parliament because you've been elected that format after that it would be wrong for well, you Jonas, to, Jonas, to Jonas, legislate I, to, 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 if i could just yes. finish the question to legislate uh, for english health affairs mm. when english um, individual mps could not legislate for scottish Jonas, health okay. affairs isn't that your position okay, can't, can't. you're, you're position? now asking me you're now asking me to, to speculate my position not for this coming parliament but the one after now with respect three successive secretary of state for health have failed to go the distance in this parliament i think i'll be doing very well if i go the distance in the next parliament without committing myself as to where i am the parliament and, after and in general you don't have a view about whether or not scottish mps who have devolution in health and education should be able to vote for english health and education policies what we have said is that we are certainly committed in the first year of the parliament to make sure we tackle this very serious and normally affecting scotland and if we don't i think there'll be much greater strains on the union thereafter we want to look at the question of devolution in england so that those issues of health and of education of social work can be tackled regionally and not all settled at westminster very i do well. think that would be in the interest of everybody thank you um you are viewing or listening to election call. Um, if you want to call Robin Cook, the number to ring is 071-799-5000. And we will go on now to John Third, who is ringing from London. Mr Third, is your election call to Robin Cook? Hello, Mr Cook. Um, I'm Good a morning. widower, yes. now living alone yes. in a three-bedroomed house in Ealing. Yes. I have an income derived from uh, a company uh, yes. pension and estate pension right and i'm not entitled to any dss additional benefits right can you tell me what on earth is fair 
about Labour's so-called fair rates scheme. When a similar house mm -hmm. in the same small street in which I live has four wage earners and they would only pay the same as I, a pensioner living alone. Mm -hmm. It really does seem to me that the uh, council proposed council tax or a local income tax proposed by the other two parties or even the poll tax would be fairer than Labour's so-called fair rate scheme. His particular case identified? Well, first of all, we have been through the poll tax with the Greatest Bank, Mr. Third, and I do not think the vast majority of the population would assent with your proposition that it has proved fairer than the rates. Quite the reverse, it has proved the greatest tax disaster in the history of Britain and has led, actually, to the greatest debt recovery exercise in the history of the world. 11 million warrants now outstanding for payment. Secondly, what the, is clearly different between ourselves and the Conservative Council tax does indeed, and you're quite right, relate to the point that you're making about the treatment of people who are living as couples or people who are living singly. And I think the question that really you have to answer, Mr. Third, is what on earth is fair about the proposal by the Conservatives that couples should pay more than single people irrespective of income? Why should a millionaire living in one house get an automatic 25% discount when a couple living next door who may be pensioners have to pay 25% more with no reference whatsoever to their income? And that, of course, was the great injustice about the poll tax. It paid absolutely no regard whatsoever to income. As one Conservative Mr. MP Third, said... Mr Third, I'm going to go back to Mr uh, Third on of this. Course. Um, Mr Third, is that an answer to your question? Mm. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, the millionaire question, I mean, that's hmm. been brought up again and again and again. And as it's a, true. A, a miraculous that's piece of good, a good true. PR. I'm, I've explained to you my situation. I am certainly not a millionaire. No. And it does seem to me that to provide something for people who are living alone, such as is, is going to be provided in the council tax, of a, I think it's a 25% discount, yes. is it not? Yes, it is, irrespective is of your income. Then coming through with this over... It's just going back to the old rating system. Is, where is, in, is, is Mr. Third... Where in Ealing, if, I'm, if I might just finish, where in Ealing, when we last had a Labour local council, it's now Tory, but when we last had that, my rates went up to £1,100 a year for the privilege of living in my own house. Just on, the, on, on what he is saying, he is saying, Mr. as I understand, Mr. Third, that, that he is a single person, same street, four earners. They're going to be paying the same. His question is, is his case fair, or is that an anomaly that you have to accommodate? First of all, to take this question, are we going back to the rate system? For, in the first instance, that is perfectly true. We are going back to the rate system because it's so important and so urgent that we get rid of the poll tax system, which has been so unjust, has caused so much hardship, and is so unfair. Secondly, having got back to the fair rate system as the means of getting rid of the poll tax, what we're then going to do is to modernise and change that rate system, and indeed, yes, look at ways in which we can relate it more to income. How will but you it is to help him? In his case, he is somebody, as he quite clearly is saying, who is not eligible for DSS benefit, who is receiving an additional uh, income from uh, superannuation payments. He is going to be paying a rate based on the property in which he is living. And a four-income house hang on, hang on, be hang on, hang on. If, if I can finish, if I can sure. finish. What he is asking for is an automatic 25% discount, which would not apply to a couple next door who may be pensioners without that private superannuation scheme. Now, I don't think, Jonathan, that is correct. If One, we, what we should certainly be doing is targeting help with paying local tax, but targeting help to those who need it on income grounds, who do not have the money, not because well, there's one, two or three people in the household. Jonathan. Quick word, Mr. Third, yes. Could I come in? Uh, I'm not making an appeal for the 25% uh, uh, discount. I, that, that's what we've been discussing, It does seem third. to be a fairer element. I am drawing the comparison between two houses of a similar size in the same street where the income in one house is probably three times, if not four times, the size of the income in another house. And under the rating, your fair rate, so-called fair rate system, we, I would be paying the same as a house yeah. in which the income is probably three times more than I. 
But Mr. Third, what you're asking, what you're seeking to defend is not that you should get the advantage over that household that has a higher income. What you're seeking to defend is a proposal that every person living alone, irrespective of their income, gets the 25% rebate. Now, he's just saying his your, situation your is case, unfair, isn't he? Well, I think, I think it is totally unfair. No, that, his, his situation. Uh, no, wait, 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 Mr. John, John, if I can finish the point. I think it would be totally unfair and unreasonable if we were to say that everybody living alone, irrespective of their income, and there are some people living alone without family responsibilities who have a decent and reasonable income in a very comfortable position, that they should automatically get a 25% rebate. Secondly, there is the other and very important issue here. If you are going to get into the issue of saying that you are entitled to that automatic discount because you live alone, then we're straight back at one of the major problems of the poll tax, which is that you then have to have a register buttoning down where everybody lives and what the relationship is to everybody else. Are they really married or are they living alone together in the same house? Now, that caused not only immense offence through the poll tax, but it added immensely to the cost of collecting and also, I have to say, Mr Third, to the bill you have to pay. Mr Third, thank you very much for raising that point. Uh, Loretta Fleming now from Swanage in Dorset. The Labour Party is constantly carping about VAT. If mm. you dislike it so much, have you any plans to reduce it to mm. the level which pleases you, Mr Cook? It's not just the Labour Party that carps about VAT, if I may say so. Everybody I meet complains bitterly at the fact that they are now paying very much more in VAT than they ever did before. I remember very well that front page of the Daily Mail in which they promised us that there would be no increases in VAT, they had no plans to double VAT. And then, within a month of the general election, they double VAT from 8% to 15%. Since then, they've put it up to 17.5%. And I find it very odd that we have a government that has dramatically increased that tax, now trying to say that it's Labour that wants to put up tax. Are you going to reduce VAT? Was sadly, uh, sadly, we cannot make any commitment that we are going to reduce VAT. If we had had the last 12 years over again, then many of the decisions that have been taken in those 12 years would have been different decisions, and we would not now have a 17.5% rate of VAT. But we're inheriting the situation of those 12 years and the real world. We, we have, have to, to work Fleming. within it. Ah. Well, the answer is just as I suspected. Yes. And I've certainly watch events with great interest. Indeed, it's a clear but, answer, but, wasn't it? But I they won't do it. We're not going to reduce it. But if I can say this, Jonathan, we're also quite clear, we're not going to increase it. Now, can you really trust the word of Conservatives who have, at three successive elections, told you that they're not going to increase VAT, and twice in those 12 years have increased VAT, so it's now not just double, it's more than double it was before. Loretta Fleming, thank you. And now David Davy from Broadstairs in Kent. Uh, I'd like to put it to you, um, Robin. Um, as your party condemns Tory policies and the harm they do to our country, mm. do you not see that by supporting the two-party, first-past-the-post system, that your party is as responsible for the past 13 years as if you had inflicted those policies yourself? Yes, I think, sir, that your question is possibly addressed to the wrong person because I have frequently criticised the first past the post system and, Jonathan, we've been through this in a number of times in the studio. I would agree with the, one of the underlying thrusts of your question. Let's, first of all, get the point of agreement and then we can go on to what the Labour Party is going to propose in the next, in the next Parliament. First of all, the points in which you and I agree. I think it is outrageous that twice, in 1983 and in 1987, We've had a government elected on a minority vote, only about 42% share of the vote, and on the back of that minority vote piled up a record majority in the House of Commons, thumping majorities because of the freak way in which the voting system operated. And then, having got that record majority, then ignored the views of many of even the people that voted for it and put in policies without even the 42% support, like the poll tax, like hospitals opting out. So that system is undemocratic, is wrong, and I personally believe that it should be changed. Changed in a way, for instance, that will give fair representation to the million and a quarter people across the south coast of England who voted Labour in 1987 and on that occasion got only two Labour MPs. Now, this is your personal now, view, of yes, course. Yes, it is. Now, it's I can't, not the now Labour Party's now, view. Well, what the Labour Party is saying is that we are having a very open and democratic debate about constitutional reform and electoral reform in particular. The Labour Party has set up the Plant Committee, which I must say has produced what I think is the most comprehensive and most stimulating study of the case for change in the electoral system. The work of the Plant Committee will continue when we're in government, only it will then have an official status because it will be reporting to a government, not to a party, and we'll be looking with great care at what it says. 
in the meantime, and I think this is the particular interest to our caller here, in the meantime, if you look at Labour's manifesto, there are a number of quite clear and quite specific commitments on electoral reform. For instance, the Scottish Parliament, about which we were talking earlier. Although you might say that Labour's the first party to benefit from the first past the post is in Scotland, we are saying in Scotland we want to have electoral reform for that Scottish Parliament. We're also saying we want to have electoral reform for the new uh, government we're going to elect for regional assembly in London. We're going to have electoral reform for the second chamber for the House of, uh, in place of the House of Lords that we're electing. As we progress with regional assemblies, they may well be developed on a different system. Are you existence. encouraged, Mr. Daly, so by this? There will encouraged? certainly be PR for some forms of election if Labour is elected. Well, I'm encouraged by it. Of course, what, what I really, why I really put the question in that form was mm. that I wanted to try um, to, to, to persuade or, or shame the, the, the Labour Party into doing this, into really seriously um, um, thinking about, not thinking about, okay. but actually bringing in PR. Thank you very much, Mr. David. Just let me, you said the system, Robin Cook, was undemocratic mm. and wrong because it produced a majority yes. rule with minority governments. Would it be, in your judgment, undemocratic and wrong if a Labour government were persisted to r rule with a minority of the popular vote um, but a majority of the seats in the House of Commons? I have always been candid in my view that if we find ourselves in the majority in this coming Parliament, one of the f things that we should do is make sure that we do produce a fair system of voting so that never again do we have to live through the last 10 years in which we had that record majority. And to use your words, it would be undemocratic and wrong if you didn't do that. I believe that we should provide a system which will great, greater democracy and representation to our own people who vote Labour and the South Coast because and the don't get representation. And the system otherwise, to use your words, would be undemocratic and wrong, yes? I have frequently criticised this system, Jonathan. I think I would have to eat an awful lot of words if I were to try not to do so but now. That, um, but you don't quite use the word undemocratic and wrong, although you believe it. But it's a little uncomfortable just to say undemocratic I, and wrong, Jonathan, yes? I, I, there's no doubt about where my position is, okay. and that is that we should have a more democratic system, which I believe would also be in Britain's interest. There's also no doubt where the Labour Party now stands on this. We are quite openly having a debate about it, which is refreshing compared, I think, with many of the other parties. Not often you see a political party prepared to have such an open debate on such a very important constitutional principle. Thank you for raising that point, David Davey. And now, Roy Landgraf, ringing from Canvey Island in Essex. Uh, good morning, Mr Cook. Good morning. Uh, the thing that bothers me, I'm a trade unionist, I'm also an NHS patient. The Royal College of Nursing have a, a, a no-strike clause in their rules and regulations. Mm. The, other, the uh, other unions have not. Don't you think that all unions should have a, a, that strike clause, that they should never go on strike against the most vulnerable of all, the hospital patient? No, I do not think it would be right for a government to impose a no-strike agreement, because that is removing a very important issue of civil liberty which is observed in all free societies which at the end of the day in any conflict which in which the employer is refusing to come to the negotiating table that labor should have the right to withdraw its labor and to act otherwise is to criminalize an act which throughout the rest of Europe and indeed for now includes here Eastern Europe throughout the rest of Europe is now recognized as an important civil right that however is not to say that it would be correct or right of the nurses to exercise that civil liberty and to withdraw their labor. And here I have to go back over my experience of the past five years, and which we have on a number of occasions had very substantial unrest within the health service as a result of conflict between the conservative government. Conflict, I'm sorry to say, often sought by government, which often seem to want to have confrontation in the health service. And whenever that's happened, whether it was the nurses, or whether it was the ambulance staff, on every occasion both the nursing staff and the ambulance staff made it perfectly clear they were not withdrawing the labour from emergency cases, urgent cases, they were not withdrawing at the expense of patient care. Mr Langroth, um, are you happy with that? Well, yeah, I'm happy, but the, the point was this, people who went to, uh, or admitted to hospital for whatever reason Absolutely. do so through necessity, yes. not through choice. Yes. They should never have to worry about any possible industrial action which could impede but, their recovery. But, but, do you agree? Absolutely. And I, if anybody looks at the way in which nursing staff have behaved over those last few years, even when in conflict with the government, you can see that the nursing staff have throughout been anxious to make sure that the patients did not suffer from their confrontation or their industrial dispute with the government. You don't see and that no-strike clause being removed, Robin? I don't see a no-strike agreement being imposed by government, because if you impose it by 
government, Jonathan. What you're then doing is removing that civil liberty. But because the civil but liberty exists... there's a clause exists, there... At the, you've, you've made that point very clearly. There's a clause there at the moment. Do you oh, see that staying or leaving in uh, case of the That's a matter masses? for the RCN. It okay. is in the RCN. And uh, the RCN are perfectly entitled to agree among themselves that, yes, we have this right to take strike action, but we do not propose to exercise that right. right. Thank you. And the reality is nurses in the NHS are never going to take action that are going to damage patient care. That's why we're so, it's so important we keep that spirit of public service in the NHS. Thank you. Now, D Duncan Watkins, ringing from Hull. Good morning, Mr Cook. Good morning. Can you reassure the public and the dental profession that the Labour government mm. would be fully committed to general dental services Absolutely. within the NHS? Yes, without any equivocation and without any hesitation. One of the most worrying ways in which privatisation is now hitting the NHS is in the number of dentists who find that they cannot continue to provide NHS dentistry. Indeed, the government itself had a survey in January which showed that even by January, a quarter of all dentists had now withdrawn from NHS adult cover. And if they were to proceed with their very damaging proposals to claw back uh, what they allege are overpayments in the dentist contract, I suspect that quarter would very quickly become 50%. I have met with the British Dental Association. I have given them a number of undertakings as to what we will do in office, the very first of which is that we'll sit down with the British Dental Association and agree with them on a review of the dentist contract because it cannot be in the interest of either the dentist or patients or even government that we have a situation in which the government turns around and attempts to claw back payment that were paid to dentists under the terms of a contract that the government itself signed up to. That's more money for dentists you're promising. I think there's going to have to be more money for dentistry, Jonathan, uh, because I certainly am committed to making sure that we are going to keep dentistry in the NHS. Have you My costed worry, that? Have you costed that? Uh, it is impossible to cost it, Jonathan, because it's a matter of negotiation between ourselves and dentists. Okay. It would be quite wrong of me to give any figure that reveal my negotiating hands in advance. Mr Watkins? And could you clarify your plans as regards patient charges, for example, checkups? On the questions of dental checkups, we have a clear commitment and a manifesto that we will abolish charges for the dental checkup. Now, I, I, it, that's not just because we're concerned about dentistry and keeping dentistry in the NHS. It's also because of a very fundamental principle, which also applies to eye charges, the charges for the eye test. And if you're going to have a screening system, you want to encourage people to come forward for that screening. And that's why it's so daft to charge them if they come forward for the screening. Those dental charges um, cease uh, were you to be elected on August, April 9th immediately? No, I cannot give a commitment on timing, Jonathan, but we have a manifesto commitment on this, and as with our other manifesto commitments, we'll be making as rapid progress as we can. And that will be in the lifetime of a parliament? Oh, yes, oh, yes. And you've costed, you've costed that too? It will, uh, all our commitments in that manifesto are intended to take place over a lifetime of parliament. Precisely when we can bring it in is, of course, a matter both of legislation and of finance. What's the cost of removing dental charges? I think the government's last estimate of it was £60 million, but I've long ago ceased to trust their estimates. OK, thank you very much. And now, uh, thank you for ringing, Mr Watkins. Robert Simpson now from Durham. Good morning. Good morning. Mr Cook, um, I don't doubt your sincerity for one moment in that you want to improve the service mm. of the NHS, <coughs> which, after all, is what the majority mm. of the population have to use. Mm. Now, in my case... I have a chronic illness, I've got multiple sclerosis, so I couldn't get private health care even if Absolutely. I wanted to. Right. So Quite I right. have to use yes. whatever the health service yes. gives me. So my question is, why are you being so dogmatic in saying you, you, you won't even give the government's reforms a chance to, to see if they're going to work or not? Because, for, for example, mm -hmm. I go to my local hospital, either in Durham or possibly to the regional centres in Newcastle. Yes. When I get there, I may be treated very well. Mm -hmm. I often am. Good. But sometimes, and I'm sure I'm not the only person to find this, yes. sometimes you're treated as though, you know, patients are rather an inconvenient um, part mm. of the system and the hospitals who work very well, if it wasn't for these nasty people called patients who demand things and have to be treated and talked to. And, you know, and, and the point I'm making is there's no incentive at the moment, under your proposal, as far as I can see, there's no incentive on the staff working within the NHS to um, treat their patients well. Um, the, at the bottom line, they get paid whether you live or you die, whether you're happy or whether you're sad, or, or mm. what. 
So, no. you know, what, what, why won't you give no. the government's proposals a chance? Why don't you give them a chance? No, I mean, no, no, he, Robin Cook. With, with respect, I think he's asking a quite separate set of questions, which is about our plans in relation to, for instance, the care he receives and other patients receive. And let me say straight away, we have no intention whatsoever of paying staff, irrespective of whether or not their patients die or live. Quite the reverse. In our document on health, what we've stressed is that it is high time that we moved away from simply measuring quantity of treatment and started to look at quality of treatment, that we started to develop new measures of outcome of treatment so that we could identify those hospitals where the quality of treatment may not be satisfactory in the way you're indicating. Secondly, we've also made a clear commitment that we are going to set up a quality commission. That quality commission is going to be concerned with raising the standards of service in the health service not just clinically, but also in particular the way in which patients like you are treated as individuals. What sanctions and are there for poor service? Well, if, if I can just finish what we're going to do to so raise the service, and then I'll come back to the sanctions. Uh, th that Quality Commission will be making sure that those hospitals carry out systematic surveys of patient satisfaction and gets into those hospitals and health authorities where there is a low level of patient satisfaction, where those surveys identify that there's something wrong. And, and thirdly, and then I'll come on to Johnson's very interesting point, thirdly, we've also said that we do want some service sampling by managers. Uh, I have been in many reception areas where, frankly, I, as health spokesman, have been confused. What we've said is maybe senior managers who spend uh, half a day, half a shift a month sitting in a reception area, seeing what actually happens to the public. That, after all, is what a number of industries are now doing in some c c big businesses in Britain. Maybe we should try that out inside the health service. Now, on the question of sanctions, we are going to create a new system of incentive funding which will reward those health authorities and those hospitals that move best along our plans to develop the health service, one that's patient sensitive, and getting service in the community, getting services into primary care, and tackling the issue of how we shift the balance away from a preoccupation with quantity into a concern with quality as well. That will reward those health authorities that do best, and of course it will leave out those that do badly. Robert Simpson, thank you very much for ringing. And now Paul Gowers from High Wycombe, your call. Mr Cook, why won't the Labour Party set about categorically proving that the Conservative Party are privatising the NHS? There are so many specific examples mm -hmm. of privatisation in practice that I think if they were brought to the public attention, they would have substantial impact. What, Mr Gowers, are your, just outline very briefly your examples of this? A particular example for, um, is a, a hospital kitchen that is required to tender mm. for provision of patient meals on a daily basis. Other examples are telephone charges being increased at public call boxes, paramedical services in hospitals being asked to submit their services in the form of an organised limited company. Okay. Now, these are examples of which I have specific um, experience, and I would like to ask the Labour health spokesman why he doesn't just highlight these do those very examples, definite examples. Oh, yes. Do those examples, like oh, yes. tendering, include yes. uh, in your just in your uh, description privatisation? Oh, so those, those examples certainly exist, John. But are they privatisation, as, he, as, oh, as the caller suggests? Yes. They plainly are privatisation, and the competitive tendering in the NHS has done immense damage to the standards of cleanliness and catering in our health service. But I do have to say, Jonathan, I mean, I'm a bit phased by this line of attack. I mean, I, it is the first time I think I've been criticised for surprising. not saying enough about privatisation. Yeah, I'm much more familiar with the argument that they're not privatising it. I, I welcome this call. It supports the evidence that we're giving. And I would say to you that, you know, with respect, we have repeatedly and quite dramatically and successfully highlighted the way in which privatisation is hitting not just the staff of the NHS, but much more seriously is hitting patient care. And one of the main reasons why so many people write to me is because they have been obliged to go private because they could not get the treatment they needed in the time they wanted on the NHS. Thank you very much, Mr Gower. Thank you very much. You're the first caller I've ever heard say that Robin Cook has failed to make <laughs> the charge of privatisation. But anyway... I'll go back um, and try that harder. Would, that debate I'll try will harder. Try hard. I bet you will. Uh, thank you very much, Robin Cook, for coming in this morning. Tomorrow morning, uh, it's your election call to Simon Hughes for the Liberal Democrats. As always, the lines are open from 8 o'clock in the morning, both on BBC One and Radio 4. The programme itself starts at five past nine, so do join us tomorrow morning. That's Simon Hughes. But this morning, from Robin Cook for the Labour Party and from myself, 
very good morning to you.